Today's reading describes the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. I am reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, the disciples said to Jesus, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover meal? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city. A man carrying a water jar will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Prepare for us there. The disciples left, came into the city, found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. That evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. During the meal, Jesus said, I assure you that one of you will betray me, someone eating with me. Deeply saddened, they asked him one by one, It's not me, is it? Jesus answered, It's one of the twelve one who is dipping bread with me into this bowl. The Son of Man goes to, his je- goes to his death just as it is written about. But how terrible it is for that person who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he had never been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. He took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I assure you that I won't drink wine again until that day when I drink it in a new way in God's kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. On my uh, 40th birthday, I was given a surprise party. Now, I've got to tell you, I don't really care for surprises. And that's because I'm so gullible that it takes almost no effort for you to surprise me. And so on the day of my 40th birthday, I was at home uh, getting the house ready for what I thought would be a quiet uh, family uh, celebration together when a friend of mine came to the front door and asked me if I could help her change her, fra- her flat tire. Now, never mind, it never occurred to me to even ask how she got to our front door. <laughs> so I happily got in the car. I, I invited her to get in the car with me, and we drove to a city park where she said she'd left her car. And I got out of the car, and there was no flat tire on her car. And I looked up, and there were all these people that I knew. And they said, surprise. (laughs) And then we uh, shared a meal together. You know, most of the significant moments in my life have involved a meal. 
Even when our daughters were born, the hospital gave us a steak dinner to eat in, in Amanda's hospital room to celebrate the birth of our children. Uh, do hospitals still do that anymore? <laughs> Whether it's birthdays or anniversaries or graduations or, 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 or farewells, meals bind us together as family and friends. And such meals do more than than words themselves could could ever communicate. The meals feed our bodies. But there's something more than that. I mean, that meal does something more than that. It changes us so, so that after that meal, part of who we are is the people who share that meal together. And so in this morning's scripture, we, we hear how Jesus and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. And this was the meal where they, remembered what, uh, where they remembered what life was like when God's people were living in Egypt. For 400 years, they were living in slavery. And they prayed, and they prayed that they would be delivered from Uh, the oppression of one pharaoh after another. But for 400 years, that prayer remained unanswered. And to think I get impatient when I don't get an answer after two or three days. For 400 years, they prayed. And then finally, God sent a deliverer by the name of Moses, who said to the people, tomorrow we leave. But that night, the angel of death would visit the homes in Egypt, and that angel of death would pass over those homes that had had the blood of the lamb smeared on their their doorposts. So that night, they slaughtered the lamb, they smeared the blood on their doorposts, and that night, when the angel of death came to the homes in Egypt, the angel passed over the homes that had the blood of the lamb. And the next morning, Pharaoh said... (laughs) Get out of here. Just go. And that night, their last meal, that's the Passover. And so 1,400 years later, Jesus and his disciples have gathered to remember. I mean, this was a meal that they shared together every year. But this year was different. I mean, for three years, they they had traveled with Jesus, and, and, and everywhere they went, there were crowds. I mean, people wanted what Jesus had to offer. Jesus was like this rock star. People wanted to be wherever he was. But this year was different. They're in Jerusalem, but now Jesus is controversial. There are people who are out to get him. I mean, if he is the Messiah, then, then why does he keep breaking all these religious rules? And the people were so stirred up that the Romans were, the Romans were ready to crack down. And the disciples knew that if Jesus went down, they would go down with him. Now, Jesus had been trying to prepare them. But if they'd been listening, they, they'd filtered out this part about death. I mean, after all, if God is with you, things get better, not worse, right? I mean, they stuck with Jesus. With Jesus, things, life is, is bound to get better, not worse. Look at the miracles. Look at all the healings. And so they were looking forward to this meal together. But it's already Passover week, and nobody had uh, bothered to put the preparations together. And as they approach the city, Jesus says to them, when we get to Jerusalem, things are going to get bad. And they must have been thinking, then why go there? I mean, why walk into danger when you could avoid it? Why walk into danger when you could avoid it, when you could wait it out? And then Jesus sends two of them into the city to check on the 
arrangements. It turns out Jesus had already made the preparations. And so that night, under the cover of darkness, they sneak into the city. This time there's no crowds, there's no waving of palm branches, there's no shouts of Hosanna. There's just this unsettled feeling that something is not right. That something horrible is about to happen. I mean, this joyful meal that they're about to share together, and yet everybody feels so uncertain. And Mark tells us this. During the meal, Jesus said, I assure you that one of you will betray me, someone eating with me. Well, deeply saddened, they they asked him one by one, it it is not me, is it? (laughs) As as if they would know or would, you know. It's not me, is it? And and Jesus answered, it's one of the 12, one who was dipping bread with me into this bowl. The Son of Man goes to his death just as it is written about him, but how terrible it is for that person who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he'd never been born. Folks, this book is filled with stories of people who were living with extraordinary uncertainty. And if uh, that's where you happen to be this morning, if you are in the face of something uncertain, some confusion, something, so or fear, or, or it feels like your life has suddenly crashed down around you, this is your book. I mean, it's not the story of prosperous people who lived a charmed life. I mean, this is a story of uh, of people who who feel like things are are going great. They wake up on Monday morning, the sun is shining, it's a great day, but by Tuesday afternoon, their lives are falling apart. And Wednesday, they find out they have cancer, and Friday, they've lost their job. I mean, this is not a fairy tale where people live happily ever after. I mean, this is the story of people who are facing who are facing great uncertainty. And, and suddenly, in, in the midst of all of that uncertainty, they discover that God is certain, that God is still trustworthy, that God has the whole world in his hands. I mean, look at Genesis. We find the story of uh, Joseph, who's having trouble with his siblings. His older brothers throw him into a well, and then he hears them say, should we sell him or kill him? You think you're having trouble with your siblings? I mean, here's Joseph, sell him or kill him. And we read the story, and we discover that God is right there at the bottom of the well with Joseph. Or we find the story of King David. I mean, God has promised that that, that the Messiah will come out of David's family tree. And then one day, he learns that his oldest son, I mean, if it's going to come from the family tree, it's got to be my oldest son. And, And so one day, he learns that his oldest son has gathered an army, and they're preparing to enter the capital city and replace David as the king. You think you have trouble with your kids? I mean, David's oldest son has a plan to kill him. And yet we read the story and we discover that God was right there with David in the middle of it all. Or we find the story of Mary and Joseph who have a newborn child. Is there anything more joyful than the birth of a child? And then they learn that King Herod wants to kill their child. The king has ordered that that, that babies in and around uh, Jerusalem be killed. And and so in the cover of darkness, Mary and Joseph and their child, they flee to Egypt. And it turns out God was traveling with them. I mean, over and over again, 
the stories out of this book, we find that, that in the worst of times, God hasn't let go. That God still has the whole world in his hands. Let's look again at this story from the Gospel of Mark. He says that while they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And then he took a cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I assure you that I won't drink wine again until that day when I drink it in a new way in God's kingdom. Huh? I mean, what's he talking about? I mean, the disciples had to be thinking, this is not the way it was supposed to turn out. Stick with Jesus and your life will be beautiful. And maybe that's where some of us are today. I mean, so much in life is uncertain. And in the midst of life's uncertainties, we can look around and wonder where in the world is God? I mean, how can I trust God if I have no evidence that God is doing anything in my life? The the disciples must have been thinking, I mean, we've been with Jesus. I mean, we've seen what what God could do. I mean, come on, God, do something. We, we, we saw how you were able to restore sight to the blind man, how, how you were able to feed 5,000 with just five loaves and two fish, how you were able to raise Lazarus from the dead. How cool was that? But if they would just wait a few more days and look back on this meal, do you know what they discover? Wait a few days, look back on this meal, and what they would discover is that when they thought God was not doing anything, God was preparing to do God's greatest work ever. It's in the book. I've read it. I've read the story. I know how it turns out. See, when life is at its worst... When it feels like God is nowhere to be found, when, when, when God is absent, when, when, when we are in this dark night all by ourselves, God is not finished yet. That's the story. God does God's greatest work in times of personal and national brokenness. That's when God works. And so we trust. Even when we cannot see God's hands because we know God has the whole world in his hands. Pastor Steve, that sounds good. But how's that going to get me a new job? Or get me well or fix my relationship? I mean, how is believing any of this going to get me a paycheck or or a clean bill of health or a happy family? And you know you're right. It's not going to change the circumstances of your life. but it will give you something to hang on to. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. The Hebrew word for acknowledge means literally to know. I mean, to know him. In, in, in all your ways, to, to know him. That's on the mountaintops as well as in the valleys of life. And when we get to know him at the good times, we will learn how to trust him in the bad times. And, and, and how do you know God? I mean, how, how do you get to know God? How do you know God? I mean, how do you know, really know anyone? You've got to get close. And that's Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust. The Hebrew word for trust means literally cling to. Cling to. See, the key is if you are going to cling to God, then you have to let go of anything else you've been previously clinging to. Say this with me. To trust God, I will not lean on my own understanding. To trust God, I will not lean on my own understanding. You know, a few weeks ago, I, I, I shared uh, this uh, photo with you. And uh, I had uh, my uh, grandson at me, and, and uh, I've told you about him, haven't I? Okay. <laughs> Uh, but, but when I shared this photo a couple of weeks ago, I, I did so from, from my perspective uh, of, of uh, you know, having sore arms and, and a back that was so sore I couldn't sleep that night for all the time of tossing up, you know, throwing him up, up in the air and catching him. Today, I'd like you to see this photo from my grandson's perspective. And it's all about trust. Papa up, he say. Papa up. And I toss him up into the air. And you know the best part? Was when I caught him. He would cling to me. And he'd wrap his arms around me. Who's going to catch you? Who's going to catch you when you fall? Who are you going to cling to? You know, one morning a few years ago, a woman was driving down County Road 6, and she pulled into our church parking lot. I mean, that day, I don't even think she knew that it was a church parking lot, but she, she pulled into our church parking lot, and she was at this point in her life where life felt pointless, and she had a plan. Let me remind you that suicide is a permanent solution to what is only a temporary problem. But she had a plan. And she put that plan to work. And sitting there in a car in the parking lot, waiting for the end to come, she got sick. And she had a second thought. And she walked into this building. And it saved her life. Or I think of the morning when a, a, a man pulled into our parking lot. He'd heard that this was a church that prayed for animals, that we had a blessing of the animals. And so he pulled into our parking lot. It didn't happen to be the day that we were blessing animals, but he'd heard about this somewhere. And so, so he, he, he got out of his truck, and he had, he had his dog with him, a golden retriever. And, 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 I, and I met him at the door, and, and he asked, he asked if, 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 if I could pray, pray for Pray for his pal. I mean, his golden retriever was, was terminally ill when he was near death. He had cancer. The only person he had in his life was his dog. And so we came here, we, we, we sat here with his dog on these front steps. And I placed my hands on that dog. And 
with both of us crying. I prayed for God's mercy and God's eternal care for the most important thing in his life. I mean, what are you going to hang on to? Or I remember the day that, that Earl Micka walked into this church. He was 91 years old at the time. Or excuse me, he was 81 years old at the time. And he said he needed something to hang on to. He said it was time that he made something of his life. And so a few weeks later, he was baptized right here. And, uh, and he attended worship every week until he was too sick to be here. And his newfound faith became a witness to his extended family. And it gave him something to hang on to the last year of his life. Or I think of a woman who called me in uh, April of 2020. And uh, she was isolated in her apartment and she was afraid. And we, of course, at that point, were hearing all about this coronavirus and we didn't know what was going to happen. And, and she thought about how long it had been since she'd ever been in a church. And there, over the phone, she became a member of this church. And I prayed with her. And suddenly she had something to hang on to. Or I think about Jim Weil, whose life we will celebrate next Saturday morning. And as I visited with him, with him at the end of his life, his final words to me were, Steve, tell them that I loved Jesus. Tell them that I loved Jesus. Hmm. I mean, who are you going to trust? What are you going to cling to? You know, I hear this, and I see this, and I experience this over and over and over again. In the midst of life's uncertainty, God is still certain. God still has the whole world in his hands. You know, the disciples would return to that, that moment when... When, when everything felt so uncertain to them, it would really, their thoughts would return to, to that meal that, that, that they shared together. This is my body. This is my blood. It was a meal, and yet it was so much more than just a meal. See, God is not uncertain. And I don't know what the future has to hold, but this much I know, I'm counting on it, folks. God still has the whole world in his hands. Let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for everything. Thank you that even when I cannot see your hands, That you are at work for me, for the people I care about, because you still have the whole world in your hands.